If you're here with joining us kind of for this first week here in December, know that we are in week two of our Advent series where we are preparing our hearts to do what we just sang, which was adore Christ. Uh, if we haven't yet met, my name's Jeff Parker, uh, and I get to serve here on staff at City Bridge to our friends watching online. So glad that you have joined us as well as we kind of keep crescendoing t- towards this great celebration that will um, be full in on Christmas Eve as we celebrate the birth of Christ. This real moment in the history of our world where the Lord declared loudly his desire to want to be with his creation and we don't wanna miss it. Uh, So prone as David even just prayed, are we to miss this truth, to be in such a hurry that we miss God's desire to be with us. And he's always desired to be with his creation. And as even David prayed, I loved it. We sang King of glory, come fill this place, this picture in Psalm 24 was, hey Lord, come fill the temple. Come fill the tabernacle today. As David prayed, Christ fills us, those of us that are believers. We have the Holy Spirit in us fully already. And so that line of we just want to be with you that we sing is such a perfect phrase to sing because it's our job to reciprocate the withness of God in this moment. He is with us and within us, believers. Our job is to get to be with them. That's one of the things we're trying to highlight uh, in preparation for Advent is we are reminding ourselves this grand story of God. We're calling it the meta narrative. We're reminding ourselves of the true story of why our world is as it is. And we are reminding ourselves of God's love for all of mankind. And we're doing that by moving through thematically the four movements that we see in God's word. The first being creation. We looked at that last week. This week, we're looking at the fall and the effects of sin now on this world. And then in the next coming weeks, we'll unpack redemption and culmination. And in all of it, especially today, we wanna be looking for how God has been Emmanuel every moment of the way, how God has been with us. And that is a little bit harder in the fall. And so we need to lean in and see just where God has been with us, even in mankind's darkest moments. Now, uh, just to let you behind the curtain a little bit, as many of you know, if you've been coming here for a few weeks or or years, that we employ a teaching team uh, on Sunday morning because we value the plurality of voices. We love different personalities with different communication styles, preaching, teaching the unchanging word of God. Now, one of the things you need to know about this teaching team is there's more on this teaching team than actually shows up on Sunday morning up here. Our teaching team is actually composed of six, seven, eight people that kind of help each week the communicator prepare his message. And so each week we gather in the days leading up to the message and we do kind of a practice run through of kind of here's where I'm at today, help make it better, help prevent heresy from going forth, help, help, uh, help, it, help us from boring everyone, help us from just reading our study notes, but help us. And so uh, anyway, the teaching team's a great gift. You don't get to see everyone that's on that team, but you can, I want you to be thankful for everyone that's on that team. Now, to let you a little bit further behind the curtain, uh, during my run through this week and the days leading up, uh, it was a complete mess as we move through movement number two, the fall and the devastating effects of sin on this world. So much so that the feedback, feedback was basically, okay, good news, now we know what not to do. That was basically the feedback. And uh, as the feedback kind of rolled in, your lead pastor, Kyle Kegler, looks at me and says, hey, Jeff, you're like an expert in this area, in the fall and the consequences of sin. (laughs) And so just take us to that place. (laughs) Now, it was good wisdom. And if I had to guess... The laughter of us is not a a celebration of past sin, but it's a little bit of the laughter of familiarity. Amen? Because in reality, we're all experts in the fall. And uh, no offense taken. (laughs) For one, it's a reality we all live under still today. We've seen the effects of sin in this world. We've seen it. We're experts in what we've seen and what we've heard. We know that creation that was once very good, we can see that it has been thoroughly corrupted. And two, we, we have experienced the awful of effects of our own sin right here. 
in our own hearts. As J.C. Ryle wrote, what a wreck man is compared to what might have been. We're a ruin. Corruption is all over our heart. We don't know good from evil. Uh, We are a rudderless ship tossed to and fro by every desire, and we were made this way by sin, by our fall. So true, and we know it. Last week, we reminded ourselves of God's heart towards us during creation, that, that mankind was the crowning achievement of his creation, and that he was with us even in those moments. And his aim for us was that we would rest in his goodness. That this story, this meta narrative, is not about our performance. This is about his provision. And it's a truth that we will see again on display in this movement this morning. And yet, as God's writing the story of creation, mankind kind of grabs the pen, so to speak, metaphorically, and tries to say, We'll take the story from here. Thank you very much. And as God's writing life into the story, the way that seems right to us, we grab the pen, it always leads to death. We insert death into the story. We defy God, we make ourselves the main character. And where God writes peace, we write conflict. Where God writes beauty, we write evil. Where God writes communion and my desire to be with my people, we write isolation and separation elements into the story that God did not write. This movement in the story is not past tense. It very much is present tense, even as we gather right now. So this morning, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at where sin started, when sin started. I'm going to use capital S sin. When was the moment it entered in? Capital S sin. Then how? Lowercase How has sin spread since? And then three, we're gonna look at what is God doing about it? How has God been Emmanuel? How has God been with us even in this dark moment, even in this dark movement that we still find ourselves in this utter darkness of our own doing? Turn with me to Genesis 3 and let's begin to read about when sin entered into this world. Genesis 1 and 2. If you're familiar with it, paint this amazing picture of creation, that it's perfect. And yet we look up today and we see a sin-filled world. We see a sin-marred world. And it begs the question, what happened? Let's turn to God's word. In Genesis 3, verse 1, let's read. It says, now the serpent, we know this from John and other places in the Old Testament. And literally, Revelation 20, John says, Satan is the Ancient serpent, we know this to be Satan. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, he said to Eve, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day. And one of the most tragic clauses in your Bible's coming. God wanting to be with them, the man and his wife hid themselves hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Capital S, sin 
in this moment enters the world. We're not going to unpack all that's happening in Genesis. This is not a uh, complete exegesis of Genesis 3 in this moment. We're in a series where we're moving through the thematic narrative of all of God's word. But there's one thing that I want to really emphasize of what's happening here in Genesis 3. This is no small temptation that is happening. As Satan tries to deceive and tempt mankind, this is not just a, will you do this? Will you take this piece of fruit and eat and tempt? This, friends, is a declaration of war upon God's creation and nothing less than that. Satan had already been thrown down from the heavens because he couldn't win the war against God. And so what does he do? He does the next best thing and he takes the war to God's image bearers, mankind. And he then begins to sow seeds, sow lies. And the thing that we keep repeating a time and time again throughout our years teaching here is that he is going to convince them that God's word cannot be trusted because God is not good and thus disobeying him is not really that big of a thing. He's gonna sow these lies in an effort to make war on mankind. And sure enough, Adam and Eve take the bait. They turn into traitors and they almost, again, metaphorically take the pin out of God's hand and said, we'll take it from here, God, because we think we can become center stage and become like you. And they try to write themselves into the story. And in this moment, capital S sin enters the world. Sin has entered and the world has never been the same. For sin has infected and affected everything since. Like cancer taken over a body or a virus taken over a host, sin has entered in. Paul writes about this in Romans 8, talking about the futility now that all of creation has been subjected to because of man's sin. And in verse 22, he says specifically, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together. Literally, this world groans together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the world, not only the creation, but we ourselves, even those of us who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly too because we are now under a curse. We are now under the fall. And the fallout of this sin has been wildly devastating. It has affected everything. Death has entered into the picture. Disease has entered into the picture. Natural disasters have entered entered the picture. Every act of evil this world has ever known can trace its origination back to this moment. So vast and so comprehensive a corruption that has taken place. And in a way, we have no idea the true extent of the fall. We have no idea all the different ways this creation has been subjected to it. For when man tries to write the story, it goes wildly off track. And this thing has turned into, as we said during the run through, a cosmic train wreck that we are now a part of. And there's much that we don't know about the full extent of it, but we know enough, don't we? Many of us look around and we've tasted disease or our loved ones have tasted disease and we've watched them suffer. Some of them we've watched to the point of death, even a lot in this body. I look around here and I've seen lots of you wrestle face to face with death, even in the last couple of years. And we see enough that the wild devastation that of sin and the fall has had on this world and it pains us. So many of us too look up and there's holes left behind. Parents that have abandoned or died too young. Siblings that have done children that died long, long ago and voids still remain today in us. We don't know everything that this sin has affected, but we know enough. Even for many of us, evil has come right into our own living room and affected and taken from us things that we can't get back. And it's wounding and it's hurt and it's grieved us. 
And if any of that resonates with you, I just want you to know that God sees it and God sees you. He's not blind to the devastating effects of sin in this world. In Christmas, Emmanuel, Christ coming to be with us is his answer to all of this sin and brokenness that has corrupted our world. It is his answer to death and disease and evil. These works of the devil, if you will, this is his answer. And we want you to know, if you're here, any of this resonates with you, that we're sorry to as a church and that we don't want you to walk in isolation. These elements that the enemy has written in, that we've written into the story, that the enemy plays up, it's designed, its design is to isolate us and to get us to kind of move away from the witness of being with God's people. And we don't want that for you. If we know about it, we as a church come running. But for those of you that we don't know about it, my challenge to you is invite us in. We want to come alongside you. It's one of the ways that God wants to be Emmanuel with you this season is that the presence of God's people would walk with you, journey with you, no matter how old the pain is, whether it's last night or last decade or many decades ago. Invite God's people in. Take us up on that offer. Now, these, as we know, aren't the only consequences of the fall. For when capital S, sin, kind of entered creation, yes, it has produced devastation out there. And we know it has produced devastation right in here. Paul writes about this in Romans 5, in verse 12. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, through Adam, death through sin, and so death has now spread to all men because all have sinned. That day back in the garden, devastation planted in the world and a seed of devastation was planted in each human being. Our own nature was corrupted. Each one of us planted with the seed nature, a sin nature that we now personally would experience the wildly devastating effects of sin in here and in here. And in many ways, we have no ideas the way that sin has affected us. No ideas the ways that it's affected the personality God gave, the wirings God gave us, the, the, the desires that God gave us. We have no idea in many ways do we have a complete understanding of our utter depravity. We have no idea. It is so vast and so beyond our comprehension. And yet, We know enough, don't we? There's a story. I don't think it's legend, but there's a story that uh, many in the faith have told that a man once wrote in, this was back in the 1800s, a man once wrote into the Times of uh, of London and asked editorially, what is the problem in this world? And famously, uh, a Christian author uh, an apologist, people, many of us who are fans of, and at least many of his writings, a guy named G.K. Chesterton sees this in the editorial department and says, I'll write. And all that he says is, dear sir, I am yours, G.K. What's the problem in this world? G.K. Chesterton says, I am And in a way, don't we know that? Paul, in another place in Romans, in Romans 3, 10 through 12, he says this, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. We, like Adam and Eve, are doing the tragic thing, hiding from his presence. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. So capital S, sin, paves the way for sin nature to be planted in each and every one of us. And then we have taken it from there, haven't we? 
Sin has spread. We're now in lowercase sin. You and I are now adding to the story, doing our own job of picking up the pen, trying to write ourselves in the story. And time and time again, you and I have decided that God is not good. His word cannot be trusted and that disobeying him is not that big of a deal. And we know that in some form or some fashion, that to be true. Now look, the story looks different. How we take up the pen and write our own story, it looks different for different people in this room. Yet I say something like this, and many of you have these kind of moments, these memories, maybe they're in here in your heart where you're like, oh, I know exactly the moment where I tried to take over and write myself into the story. And it's these moments for many of us that have produced deep shame and embarrassment. This moment of how could I? Why did I? Like Adam and Eve, we have these moments where we remember where we saw and we desired and so we took. And some of us in the same course of action, even after taking, we then gave to others, invited them into the mess. And some of us even beyond that have given heartily approval to those that keep joining in and doing the same thing. And we have these moments, don't we? Many of us. And every time it ends in separation from God and others, every single time. Now, maybe you're in the room and maybe you're like, yeah, I mean, I, I mean not really. I mean, there's maybe a little bit in my, I, but I, I've done pretty good at this thing. I just want to submit to you that maybe the story you are writing is one of self-righteousness. One where in the end of the day, you're still putting yourself in the center of the story going, I've done good things. I've attended church. I've, I've read some of my Bible and I've done these things. But the question is, have you been humbly with God? Not just doing things for him, not just doing things about him, but being with God. I'm convinced at some level that playing church doing some ritual religion, managing your external behaviors is just skilled hiding at the end of the day. Somehow mankind has figured out how to hide in plain sight. Well, I, I'm, I'm with God. I'm here on Christmas Eve. But at the end of the day, I think all of it is just sides of the same depraved coin. No one is righteous, not one. No one understand. No one seeks for God. And we can look back and we can see the damage. If we're humble enough, we can look back and see the damage we have done to others. And we can look back and see all of the broken relationships and all of the pain that we've caused both ourselves and others. And with this sin, we have marred the ability for people to see the image of God with us, within us. And that's why when it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that's what it means. Sin is first and foremost about the glory of God. And when we fall short, we mar the image that God has put in us. All of this is true, even for the redeemed believer. We too can't escape the effects of fall in our own sin nature. C.S. Lewis wrote this in The Problem of Pain. See if this doesn't resonate for you, believer. We actually are, he writes, at present, creatures whose character must be, in some respects, a horror to God. As it is, when we really see it ourselves, we're a horror to us. This I believe to be a fact. And he adds this, and I noticed that the holier a man is, the more fully he is aware of that fact. That we look up, those of us that have been redeemed, we know we have Christ within us, redeeming us, transforming us, and yet our sin nature still is an outlaw in our body, still looking to cause havoc. And when we don't yield to Christ in us, we yield to our sin nature, and it continues to be a horror. And I noticed the holier man is, the more fully he is aware of that fact. I think this is what Paul's getting at in Romans 7. 
in Romans 7. Paul's going to kind of speak to this war. There was a war way back in Genesis 3, and Paul's going to say it is a war that he is experiencing right here in his own heart. In Romans 7, Paul writes, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For in my spirit with Christ dwelling in me, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Christmas. God with us. Is God's answer to our depravity to our struggles, even for the redeemed believer that still wrestles with a very real sin nature that trips us up all the time. God with us, coming to us, is his answer. I know for me, this stuff resonates with me. I, 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 I look up and, and over the last few years, uh, God has done a marvelous work in many ways. And I can look back on certain sin struggles and by the grace of God, they are not nearly as prevalent today. It's almost as if God has eradicated some. And yet I look up today and there is still the seed of selfishness that is so prone to kind of rear up. This year has been one of those years where I've felt it rear up time and time again, this selfishness. And I've watched it in several instances, some with family, some with church friends, some with just in any kind of moment, I've watched selfishness rear up and I bite and I want to take the pen going, God, you may not get this one right. Let me write what needs to happen here. And it's, I set aside, I quench Christ in me. And every time I do that, the sin nature that is within produces devastation in my relationships with others and conflict enters into the picture and the further I give into that, other struggles that I've talked about up here, envy of what others get and what I don't get, people pleasing, trying to find my worth in my own performance, those continue to rage out of control. And I'm doing the very things I know I don't want to do. Who can deliver me from that? Emmanuel. So what's the problem with the world today? In a way. It's me. And every time I try to grab the pen and write myself into the story and solve the dilemma that's before me, not trusting in God's sovereignty and ability to lead the moment. So, we have painted a little bit of a dark canvas. Amen? It's a little bit of Good Friday here before Easter. But the question that I want you to begin thinking about is, what does God do next? What does God do in these moments when man takes over the story and writes something that he doesn't desire into it? When he writes conflict, when he writes pain, when, he writes, when we write sin, when we do these things, what does God do next? Rest in that question for a second. Mull it over. Because your answer to that, I think, is a good measuring stick for how you think he views you today in your own struggles. What did God do even back in the garden? I want you to think about it. Even as you remember what happened in Genesis 3, what happened in Genesis 3? Does he... Because what God does next is going to tell us how much the character of God desires to be with us. Let's go back to Genesis 3. And I want to read verse 9 because verse 8, we, we left off. I made the claim that, that, that man and his wife hiding themselves from the very presence of the Lord God is one of the most tragic clauses in your Bible. But with the pen, if you have one, go to verse 9. And I want you to circle the word but. 
So many of us have these moments in scripture this, that where the word but triggers one of our verses. Some of us, it's in Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy. Some of us, it's in Titus 3, but when the kindness of God appeared, this has become one of my new favorite buts. But. That's the fall of man right there that you're even laughing at that. But. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? We talked about a little bit last week. You can even underline Lord God in that moment. Last week we talked about in chapter one, it just says God. The the word that's used there for God is a descriptive word called Elohim. This reminder that God is all powerful. He's in control. And so it's used in Genesis chapter one on purpose to talk about his sovereignty over all of creation. And then we said in Genesis 2, 4, that the word Lord God, Yahweh Elohim shows up. Yahweh being this description of God that's personal, that's intimate, that's with his creation. It's the, it's the word that is used for God to talk about his covenant-keeping nature with his people. This is the phrase that's used in this moment, intentionally, on purpose. But the Lord God, covenant-keeping, personal, intimate God, comes to the man, calls to him, and says, where are you The first thing God does in one of the most tragic, or in the tragic moment in mankind's history that has triggered all the others is he pursues. He comes to our hiding spot. He seeks us out. Even in our lowest moment, God is with us, pursuing us. I don't know what you think about when you think about God. I know what, I, but that moment that you have in your brain or those moments or those thousands of moments where you go, I, but I've blown it more and more times. I want to let you know, God is for you even in your dark moments and he is pursuing you. We say all the time here, that gospel, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, he died for us. Notice, he doesn't come with accusation. He doesn't come with rules in this moment. He doesn't come with, you know what you've done, Adam and Eve? Do you realize what you have triggered? It is devastating. No, the first thing he does is pursue them going, where are you? You're not with me. And so I'm gonna come to you to be with you Christmas, friends, is a declaration to all of those of us still in enemy-occupied territory that I have come and that I am coming for you still. And some of you are but a step away from a victory you can't even imagine. And yet you keep hiding. Don't run anymore. Move towards Yahweh, Elohim, personal, covenant-keeping God who desires you. Move for him. Stop moving around among the trees and engage. And I don't know for you, maybe it's a confession that you need to call out to other of God's people. Maybe it's raising your hand and just saying you need help, that some of the devastation that's happened in your world has driven you away from God, that's driven you away from the church, that's driven you away from God's people. Today's a really good job morning to raise your hand and say, can someone please help? And in that way, you cry out to God. So many of us have written different types of stories Paul wrote this in Titus 3, 3 through 7, and it's a, it's a verse that so many of us are familiar with, that we resonate with. We see ourselves in this verse. I know I see myself in this verse. For we ourselves, Titus 3, 3, were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy. So true of me. Hated by others and hating one another. When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, when Christmas came in our own hearts, he saved us. Not, not 
because of works done by us in righteousness. I'm telling you, rest in the story. When we stop hiding and let him get to work in us and don't perform for him, what happens per his mercy? It's the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Christmas comes in our own hearts. Christmas is God's answer. Emmanuel, it's God's answer to the season. He's come to destroy the works of the devil, come to destroy the works even of our own sin. And the way to do it, the way you destroy sin, but not the sinners, you've got to come be with them. Die the death that they deserve to die so that that sin can be covered. More on that next week when we get to redemption. Come back for it. But put this on your Christmas card if you don't have a verse yet. 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Christmas, God with us, Emmanuel, is a wartime response to a war that Satan began a long time ago in Genesis 3. And Christmas is the great hope for those of us still living under the effects of the fall today. And so I just want to read you again the verse that we read during our Advent piece again. And so Matthew 1, we'll close with this. In verse 20, we know that the story's picking up, that Joseph is trying to figure out how to get out of this betrothal to Mary. But in verse 20, with fresh eyes, let's read this again. But as he considered these things, Joseph, that is, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, which means God with us. To those of us that have trusted in Christ, this is a declaration of peace. Saying, I see you, I know what has happened around you, and I know what has happened in you, and I'm coming for you, and I will come again. But make no bones about it. To Satan, this is fighting words. Because when the Son of God appears, I'm coming to destroy your works. And so for those in between right now, this is an invitation. That even if you've bought Satan lies, and even if you're still warring against God, come now to me. Why? While there is still time. Don't miss this Advent. Don't miss this Christmas. Come out of your hiding before it's too late. What a gorgeous declaration. What a gorgeous invitation. And so for you and me, the challenge, don't grow numb to these truths. Let them draw us closer to this God that is desperately desiring to be with us and always has. Let these truths prepare our hearts to be with them fully this season. Mm -hmm.